Good evening, everyone. And I'm really, really sorry to have kept you waiting. Um, we had a technical hitch. But thank you very much for joining us for the 2021 British Dressage Annual General Meeting. After another year of uncertainty and disruption, we decided to run our AGM as a hybrid event this year, with the meeting also broadcast live on our website, so members have had the option to watch online from the comfort of their home or attend in person here with us in Meriden. As usual, we will cover the formal business required for our AGM and receive updates from our finance director, Caroline Godfrey, chief executive, Jason Bortigam, and chief operating officer, Ben Waterhouse. We will also have individual presentations from each of the BD board members so they can provide you with an update on the work being undertaken in each of their technical areas. Importantly, there is then the chance for us to answer the questions that you have already sent in for us. If I could start by introducing your directors here this evening. We have um, Caroline, well, we've got Jason Brautigam, who I'm sure you all know, Caroline Godfrey, finance director, Simon, uh, Ben, not in the order on my list, sorry about that. Ben Waterhouse, Chief Executive, Chief COO. Then we've got Simon Bates, Sports Operations Director. Judy Harvey, International Director. Julie Frizzell, Para Director. Suzanne Homewood, Business Development Director. And that is, oh, everyone's to, trying to, we've got Paul Haler, only he isn't here, and Charlotte Osborne, training, the, uh, our training um, officer, um, who will be speaking instead of him. And then we've got Claire, Claire Moir, BD Youth Director, and Peter Storr, Judges Director. So after a rather rocky start, I hope we'll continue more smoothly. Um, while it's been another challenging year for everyone, I am really, really proud of the way we have collectively managed to bounce back from the COVID crisis, with the whole of the British dressage community showing just <coughs> such great resilience. As a result, the last six months have been the busiest in BD's history, with riders, owners, trainers, officials, organisers, and venues all wholeheartedly embracing the full calendar of fixtures and championships that were rescheduled. It's just been a huge job. We're immensely grateful to everyone involved for all of their support, and very much at the front of those are the British Dressage staff who have been working tirelessly recently in order to run everything that we'd hoped to run in the year. Um, um, and we are going to hear more about all of this in a moment, but before hearing more about this, I will hand over to our Chief Executive, Jason Bortigam, for the formal business of our annual general meeting. Over to you, Jason. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If I could just start by welcoming you to our annual general meeting, and I would like to now formally open the formal part of our AGM. Hopefully you will have already seen the notice of AGM, including our ordinary special business, as well as the 2020 accounts for British Dressage on the BD website. I will take as read the notice convening the meeting, and I can confirm that we've received two apologies this evening uh, from Paul Haler and from Anita Darkin. So if I could just quickly run through the agenda. Uh, we have the ordinary and special business to do as part of the formal part of the AGM. We will then have the chairman's overview, followed by my own chief executive's report. I'll hand over to Ben for the chief operating officer's report. And as Linda mentioned, we'll have presentations from each of the directors before answering your questions at the end. So if I just highlight the two items on ordinary business, we have to receive the financial statements of British Dressage for the year ended 31st of December 2020 and the director and auditors reports thereon, as well as to reappoint the auditors of British Dressage and to authorize the board to fix their remuneration. We also have one item of special business, and that relates to the draft articles of association submitted to the meeting that we want to propose and adopt here to replace the existing articles of association for British dressage. 
So we will move straight on to our first ordinary resolution to receive the financial statements of British Dressage for the year ended 31st of December 2020 and the directors and auditors report thereon. For this section of the AGM, I would like to hand over to our finance director, Caroline Godfrey, to present the 2020 accounts. Thank you, Jason. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, as we move on to the first ordinary resolution, I'm pleased to present the audited financial statements, consolidated audited financial statements for the year ended 31st December 2020. Needless to say, um, as Lynn has already alluded to, 2020 was a very difficult year for all of us, and particularly in trying to forecast what would happen financially. But as always, the BD team across the whole charity worked extremely hard in difficult circumstances to ensure that all of our resources were used for the benefit of BD members. So the headlines. In 2020, we made a surplus of 85,000, which is much better than we expected when the crisis hit. Um, but all of that surplus was created through the trading company, 88,000 um, pounds as when activities got going again quickly, obviously we, we then sold more test sheets, score sheets and all those things which create the surplus in trading. But that was down from 142,000 in 2019. Um, but it's important to note that the full financial impact of COVID will be seen in over a two year period at least with a loss forecast in 2021. Um, We've, you know, it's not going to be easy in 2021, as I'm sure you all know as well. Oh, wrong way, sorry. So the key numbers in 2020, our total income fell from 4.8 million to 3.4 million. And as you can see there, we, we, our membership was down, our horse registrations understandably were down, and uh, obviously our activities were down because um, we had long periods of lockdown when we weren't able to be active. But equally, our total costs fell from 4.6 million to 3.3 million um, because we were unable to undertake so many of the subsidised activities for much of the year. And I think it does show how our funds are invested in what we do. Um, over 150,000 was received by us through the government's job retention scheme when staff had reduced or nil activity possible. So a couple of key factors I just wanted to highlight before I look at the detailed numbers. And the first thing is the loyalty of, of you as members. Whilst members did retain benefits during lockdown, apart from the ability to compete, it was brilliant. It was wonderful that so many felt able to support us throughout. But equally, horse registration extensions were offered as lockdowns continued. And, and the impact of this will also be reflected in 2021 because we've spread the original horse registration income over a much longer period. Um, there was a substantial cost to this, but the board was pleased to be able to do this, seeing it as the right response in the crisis, even before we knew what the full outturn for the year was going to be, or even what the full outturn for 2021 is going to be. So this, this slide has got lots of numbers on it, um, but I hope that those of you who really are interested in the detail of the accounts have had a chance to look at the full accounts which are available online and can see all the many pages of statutory information that are presented there. But the summary is that um, this shows um, the surplus on the net movement in funds, the surplus there of 85,000 compared to 210 in the previous year. The full statutory accounts, as I said, are available online have now, have now been filed at Companies House and with the Charity Commission. But if there are any post-AGM questions on the detail of the accounts, then please do contact me via, via the office and I'll be pleased to help. So the balance sheet, again, showing our total funds of 2.3 million, which are basically nearly all unrestricted. Um, at the balance sheet date, we also held £2.8 million in cash and deposits, but obviously we had liabilities which, were, which amounted to just over a million pounds at the time. Post year end, BD has placed funds in longer term investment through uh, Brew and Dolphin, our appointed investment managers, and we've also looked to maximise returns on our cash held, albeit in a very, very low interest economy. 
And, and this, this pie chart simply shows um, the breakdown of, of, of our income in the year. Um, you see 54% coming from subscriptions and horse registrations. That was 44% in 2019. 20% for training education activities, and that was 25%. Um, sorry, it was 20% in 2019 and 25% in 2020. Championship and competition income fell from 21% in 2019 to 10.5% in 2020. Whilst these changes were inevitable with the lockdown effect, it does show the impact it had on our income distribution. So it's already mid-October, so what about 2021? As I said, it's again been a difficult year with a number of factors impacting. Um, even though the, the recovery has been amazing um, with very, very strong membership numbers. But we have the full impact of the horse registration concessions hitting, extra operational activity costs because of the um, packed um, schedule we've had with lots of rescheduled events. We've made a substantial investment in the new initiatives for the Summerford National Championships. And our IT investment, which is ongoing, the amortisation costs this year are at their highest level with lots of different phases of investment being written off this year. And subscription fees weren't in, haven't been increased since January 2019. So those are all going to impact on our 2021 numbers. And one question that's raised regularly is that of the level of BD's reserves. And um, a subgroup of the Finance and Business Development Committee looked in detail at what our policy should be, including uh, reviewing and benchmarking against what other charities should do. So our reserves policy reflects our strategic planning, budgeting and risk management processes. We're very lucky that BD has strong reserves supported by cash. And so it's right that we should review what level we need to support the business and to fund the 2021 to 2024 strategic plan. So how much do we need to support the business if there was a significant loss of income for a short to medium term period and to enable recovery afterwards? Has BD sufficient resources to respond to investment and growth opportunities as set in our strategic plan that we can't fund through our normal annual income? And also we have a commitment to invest our reserves to ensure that reserves we do hold maintain their value and don't just, particularly as we're hitting a higher inflation model, we need to make sure that those, that money we hold is working for us. So the draft reserve policy was discussed and approved by the board earlier today and we will add it to the website in due course. But I can assure you that we are committed to using our funds wisely to support BD activities whilst also ensuring that a sustain, sustainable business model is maintained for the benefit of all. We won't sit on cash just for the sake of sitting on cash, but we have to hold all these different factors in balance. So finally, in advance of the approval of the 2020 financial statements, I should state that Mazars, our auditors, were willing to attend this evening, but we agreed mutually that it wasn't necessary as they were happy with the detailed and clean audit report, which is, runs to three pages now, um, that's contained in the financial statements. Um, please do read it if you feel you need to get to sleep quickly. Um, f finally, I would like to say thank you to all our members for your continued support, which has made these numbers possible. To BD's finance team and to Andy Derry in her interim role, to BD senior management and the dedicated team of staff who support them. And, and to the members of the Finance and Business Development Committee, who um, aren't all directors, who assist in exercising good governance and financial control for us. And also, finally, to Mazars, our auditors, for their work in producing the accounts. I can also confirm that we've received no questions on the detailed accounts from the members, so I'll now hand back to Jason for the formal resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. So far, our first ordinary resolution, if you remember, if we go back to that slide, just to confirm, 
The first ordinary resolution is to receive the financial statements of British Dressage for the year ended 31st of December 2020 and the directors and auditors reports thereon. So please could I have votes for and votes against please. Okay, conf confirm that on a show of hands, all members present voted in favor of the resolution. We also received 29 proxy votes with unanimous support in favor of this resolution. And therefore, I declare the resolution duly carried. Moving on to our second resolution, we now need to look at appointing, reappointing Mazars as the auditors of British Dressage and to authorize the board to fix their remuneration. So again, could I please have votes for initially and any votes against, please? Okay, I can once again confirm that on a show of hands, all members present voted in favor of the resolution. Again, we received 29 proxy votes with unanimous support in favor, and therefore I declare that the resolution is carried. We now move on to our special resolution. There is just one special resolution, which is item three on the notice of AGM, and that is the approval and adoption of the new Articles of Association of British Dressage. A copy of the proposed new Articles of Association with a marked up document for comparison purposes have been on the British Dressage website since Thursday the 9th of September. However, I would like to take this opportunity to provide a bit more background detail on some of the proposed changes. In recent years, we've updated the memorandum and articles to reflect best practice in accordance with the Code of Sport Governance published by UK Sport and Sport England. It is vitally important that the BD Board of Directors continues to attract high caliber individuals with the right level of knowledge, skills and experience to represent members and ensure that the sport is governed effectively. The introduction of a nominations committee has provided greater scrutiny over the director nominations process, including the appointment of extra directors for specific areas of expertise. And members, importantly, now have a binding vote for all elected director positions, regardless of whether or not the candidates stand unopposed. The changes that we are proposing to the Articles of Association this year will further strengthen this process for appointing the chairman which will remain subject to the membership vote. Under the proposed changes, the position of chairman will continue to be advertised publicly and nominations invited from members. All suitable candidates, as approved by the nominations committee and the board, will then be put forward for election by the membership, with the final result of the electronic ballot being binding. Please note that in the event of only one candidate being put forward unopposed, members will still have the ability to accept or reject the proposed appointment. The chairman will continue to hold this position on the board for a maximum of eight consecutive years. However, if a director currently holds another position on the board, they can still be nominated and elected chairman by the members and serve up to a maximum of 12 consecutive years in total. Then after the 12th year, the individual must still wait another four years before they can be appointed to the board again. So again, just to reiterate, 12 consecutive years is the maximum that any individual can serve across the director and chairman positions combined. All appointments to the position of chairman remain subject to election by the membership. So on our special business, could I please have votes for this special resolution for? And any votes against, please? Once again, I can confirm that on a show of hands, all members present voted in favor of this special resolution. We also received 29 proxy votes with 26 votes in favor of this resolution and three against. I therefore declare that this resolution is carried by more than a 75% majority decision. Now, for the final part of the formal business of this year's AGM, I would just like to announce the results of the director elections that we held earlier this year. Following the retirement of Paul Haler and Julie Frizzell at the end of their second term as directors, there were two vacancies on the board for training director and para director. 
After review by the nominations committee, one candidate was put forward to the membership vote for training director with the electronic ballot carried out independently by my voice. In total, 1,560 votes were cast with 96.3% in favor of the appointment. So I am delighted to announce that Harry Payne is duly elected as training director with effect from today's AGM. So a warm welcome to Harry. The nominations co committee also interviewed all applicants for the para director role, with two candidates put forward for election by the membership. Again, the electronic ballot was carried out independently by my voice. A total of 1,405 votes were cast, with the result as follows. Tracy Ormrod received 798 votes, representing a 56.8% share, and Ursula Treadgold received 607 votes, representing 43.2%. I can therefore formally declare that Tracy Ormrod is duly elected as para director with immediate effect. <laughs> and congratulations to both Harry and Tracy who join us this evening. We are really looking forward to working with you. May I also take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks and gratitude to both Paul and Judy for their immense contribution to British dressage over the last eight years. So this ends, thank you. This ends the formal business of this year's AGM. So I'll now hand you back to our chair, Linda Whetstone. Thank you, Jason. Um, and you can now see from the slides that it's been a year to celebrate with so much to be proud about. The majority of the fixture calendar was salvaged despite the first three months of lockdown. The regionals, area festivals and winter championships were all successfully rescheduled and we enjoyed an unprecedented summer um, season of high profile championships with the Olympics, Paralympics and the Europeans all taking place in quick succession. The BD National Championships moved to a new home in Summerford, and the inaugural Summer Area Festivals and Championships took place at Arena UK only last week, and I'm told they went extremely well um, and were very well received. So we've had a tremendous summer despite the difficulties earlier in the year. Um, added to which, oops, sorry, not very good at this bit. That was that bit, sorry, here we go. Um, <coughs> Added to which the medal success of our riders has been the best ever, with a total of 14 medals, including team and individual bronze in the Olympics, and two gold, two individual golds, three individual silvers, and two bronze medals in the Paralympics. Added to that was a first ever team silver and individual bronze in the, uh, uh, no, Added to that was the team silver and individual bronze in the Europeans, and then for the first time ever, two silver medals in the junior Europeans. What a fantastic year of results, and it, really very happy to congratulate all of those involved. Um, now, it's a bit Jason and I show, but it'll stop in a minute. Anyway, back to Jason um, for, for a business update. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. So now we move on to the Chief Executive's report, and I will attempt to give you a, an overview of the business in the last uh, year, or 18 months really, since the COVID crisis began. And obviously it was a difficult start uh, to this year as well when we had the lockdown and suspension of all activity in quarter one. So we didn't start this year off in the best of fashions, uh, given that we had significant disruption throughout 2020. Our primary focus, though, was on a swift resumption of activity once restric restrictions were lifted. And we learned an awful lot from last year's experience. And rather than doing a complete suspension, um, or abandonment, in fact, of a whole season, we decided that actually it was far better to try and reschedule as much as possible um, within the uh, remit of the calendar. 
Now, our operational plan was published in mid-February, which include a very ambitious calendar of events. The winter season and summer qualification were all running in parallel within a, a restricted 10-week period during quarter two, which allowed members to use their qualifications and fulfill their championship ambitions. Now, as a result of this, membership recovered to pre-pandemic levels within 10 weeks of the restart, which is quite remarkable considering where we came from. This allowed us to plan ahead with confidence for the rest of the busy summer season. And we've almost had back-to-back -back championships, as Linda was saying, throughout the summer. Um, but at national level too, this has included our national championships, area festival summer championships, associated and quest. The resumption of activity on the 29th of March provided us with a, a perfect platform in a way for a fresh start and new beginnings. We therefore decided to finally launch the new BD brand identity, launched to coincide with the competitions restarting. All of the work and the expenditure for that was undertaken prior to the pandemic. So that was already sunk. We were ready to launch that in April 2020. So one year late, we finally managed to launch the new brand identity and also launch our new four-year strategic plan as well at the end of June. The new education system for judges continues to be rolled out with technical modules available from August this year onwards and you'll hear more about that later. And other exciting commercial initiatives include our new clothing range, which again we launched at the Winter Championships, which took place in the middle of summer, confusingly, um, and our media partnership with Horse and Country to live stream BD shows, including several of the shows taking place this month. And of course, as Caroline mentioned, there's also major investment into the new format and timetable for our national championships at Summerford. And hopefully many of you will have been able to join us there last month for what was a very successful four-day show. Now, as mentioned, we launched our strategic plan at the end of June. Um, so for those of you who joined us at our winter championships, you probably saw this at first hand. But I wanted to just, again, highlight that we have mapped out what the next three years will look like for British Dressage to take us on the journey from Tokyo through to Paris. Now, we've got five strategic objectives, and underneath each of these headings fits more detail. So I would encourage you to go and check out the BD website where we have our strategic plan online, and you'll be able to find out more detail. But whether it's under competition, participation, education, promotion, or governance, which we see as the five key strategic areas for BD, there is a lot more detail that sits underneath those plans. So we've got very ambitious plans on what we hope to deliver over the next three years. And despite all of the disruption that we've encountered over the last 18 months, as Caroline was saying, we are in very good shape now to carry these forward in 2022 and beyond. In terms of our membership update, Again, membership and horse registration has been incredibly buoyant under the circumstances. Our total membership is now at highest levels since January 2019, and our horse registrations are now at record levels. The total active members is currently uh, 17,200, compared to 14,700 at the same point in 2020, which equates to a 17% increase. What that doesn't show is that actually, at the lowest point in, during the pandemic, our membership actually fell below 14,000. So that is quite a remarkable recovery. Similarly, given that horse registrations dropped by 25%, to have now over 16,100 active horses compared to 12,600 at the same point last year is quite phenomenal. We have reviewed our membership packages and the benefits to ensure that we continue to add value to members uh, and encourage new members to try affiliated dressage, and we'll be announcing some of those uh, changes shortly. So we're looking forward to an exciting year next year, hopefully with a full calendar of events restored from the 1st of January, and fingers crossed, we'll be able to run the sport once again, under normal circumstances. Thank you very much. I'll now hand you over to Ben, who is our Chief Operating Officer. Thanks, Jason. Good evening, everyone. Um, despite the challenges that 2020, 2020 and 21 has brought, we've been really pleased to continue to make operational improvements across the business. In IT, during quarter one and two of this year, we continued our investment into the development of BD Online to provide additional functionality and reporting capability for the office staff. 
The next area being prioritised for development is a training education database, which Charlotte will tell us has been a long time coming. This has now been scoped and fully costed to enable work to commence during the next, the next month or so, and hopefully be delivered by the end of March 2022. We've also re reviewed our use of BookWen and moved across to the HorseMonkey platform to provide a much simpler, better integrated and more user-friendly experience for members and staff. Hopefully in the future, there is the potential to link the platform with BD Online so that we can track booking activity attendance on a member's profile. More recently, we've completed an insurance tender with our business and member insurance provision being looked at in the round. And as a result, KBIST were appointed as our new insurance provider and BD partner with effect from July of this year. The next stage of this process will be to complete a full assessment of our insurance needs for now and into the future to ensure our policies remain fit for purpose and provide good value for money. At the start of the year, we went through a restructure of our regions. The process led to a reduction from eight regions down to six and involved a change in focus for our development officer team. Although this was a very big shift for the staff in particular, and also our volunteers, I'm pleased to say that we have retained the vast majority of our regional reps within the new structure, and all have been working really hard to make sure the new structure is a success. In terms of participation, we've included a total of 7,156 attendees in our regional training activity, and that's despite quarter one being in lockdown. As expected, Zoom and online delivery continue to remain very popular across our activities, particularly for our judge training activity, where we, rec where we recorded 258 sessions with over 1,800 attendees. Despite lockdown leading to the cancellation of our interregional events, we managed to successfully deliver the Youth Home Internationals and the Senior Home Internationals at Valeview and Mount Ballon. And we're now conducting a review of our team competitions, which is due to, due to take place before the end of this year. In terms of our staff and Team BD, um, during the course of the year, we've welcomed some new appointments. Um, so we have Mimi in the training education department, Nikki in sport operations, Alice in our marketing team, Shelby in membership, Felicity, who's joined us as a maternity cover in Para, and Kerry, who has just completed her maternity cover in Scotland as our DO for the region. In terms of our business operations, we've managed to keep business as usual during the lockdown and the ongoing restrictions, and staff have carried on with home working throughout, throughout this period. As a business, we're about to formally introduce a hybrid working model, and our IT investment has allowed us to continue to work seamlessly from home and provide a good level of customer service to all of our members. But of course, we couldn't develop as a sport or a business without the vital input of our volunteers and committees. So I wanted to place on record our sincere thanks to all our volunteers at whatever level and whatever part of the world they help us out in, uh, but particularly those who are finishing their terms with us during this year. From our technical committees, this includes Sophie, Becky, Clive, Jane, Nikki, and Joe. And from our regional committees, Tim, Sue, Joe, Joyce, Yvonne, Amelia, Kelly, Megan, Tracy, Jen, and Laurie. I want to say a huge thank you to all of those people I've just listed and all of our volunteers that continue to help us run our sport and move things forwards. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, we've had an interesting year for the um, sports operations and ever-moving targets through the year. How do we move this on? Arrow. arrow? Down arrow. Down arrow. Down arrow. Um, we've um, relied heavily on the staff, the organisers, the officials and our members to move to ever moving targets and deliver as much of the calendar as we could deliver and deliver it without any certainty at the time as to how a show would actually end up appearing or what restrictions will be in place and people have delivered fantastically. Um, We've, um, we've had a really good increase. The, the number of um, show days and the number of starters has really come back in a, in a very good fashion. 
and we've we've had a, an exceptional return to the sport. The um, the seasons have, have have come back well. We've had um, two seasons brought together into one, which has been exceptionally hard for the um, for the staff in the office to deliver, as normally it it fits over a much longer period. And huge success in the way these championships have come back. Um, the uh, the new the new area area festival championships at Arena UK has been a particular new success, and starting a new show off at this time has been a real achievement. And we obviously look forward to um, coming through to uh, Quest and the associated championships. The um, the rules and the innovation of sport has been really quite tight this year, with the focus being on delivering just what we can deliver. Um, there, there are just minor changes that have been made, um, making the area festival qualification, back, taking that back to simply three scores of 60%, um, and these other minor changes. The, um, the FEI tests coming back to being in harmony with the FEI tests, so the, the, any changes will fall in line as the FEI update their tests. And again, the, uh, the WIP rule just clarified. Um, we have the, um, the, the uh, clarification of rules of what to do in, in weather conditions of how we restart a test and clarifying just how payment is made for um, prize money so that we, we keep to a, a prompt response. Obviously, this requires details for the riders to be available to organisers. And we've removed the mandatory spurs and um, aligned ourselves on the um, sensory hairs with the FEI rules. Um, and then we're going to be clarifying the um, surgical procedures. And I'll hand over to Judy, who's had rather a good international year. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, it has been a, 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 an amazing year. What a year it's been. Incredible. Uh, <laughs> it's been a struggle. I'm trying to find the down arrow, but the yeah, space, space bar works. That's good. Um, Tokyo Olympics, incredible results, fantastic that what these guys did and, and pulled off. Um, first of all, I really need to thank my co-selectors, David Trott and Jenny Ward. We've had uh, a very different kind of year and a very different kind of selection campaign. We were unsure, and I remember Jason Brautigan, who's fond of a bet, was absolutely assured me that the Tokyo Olympics were not going to take place. I said, they damn well are going to take place. And uh, he still hasn't paid up, but I don't think I ever was strong enough in my convictions to take the bet on. But um, so we were, will the Olympics happen? We had COVID to deal with. We had equine herpes to deal with. We had Brexit to deal with. How these riders, and I have to thank them all sincerely from the bottom of my heart, had the persistence and the endurance to get themselves out there, get themselves qualified, get their lorries certified, get themselves across to Europe, qualify, uh, earn their place on the selection team, you know, to be selected on the team. It was a phenomenal effort for them all. And obviously only four of them could go to Tokyo and only three of them could compete in Tokyo. Um, but what, what a trio, what, what fantastic <laughs> results they, they brought home. And uh, they're all people who have started from a very basic level and work their way up through dressage and it just shows what you can achieve if you've got a bit of skill, luck and commitment and true dedication. So well done to them. Um, all credit too to uh, Lou and Leanne and Sharon in the office because the juggling and the jumbling and the changes of minds and the changes of where we're going and what we're doing and who can go where and how and shows being cancelled it has been a real nightmare of a year and uh, that we've just been juggling and juggling and juggling con continuously to get these riders out there 
able to perform and able to get the experience they need for those results. And you know, we not only had the Olympics, we then had the Europeans as well for the seniors and followed up very quickly, which was great in a way because it gave um, our riders a chance well, our reserve rider, Gareth Hughes with Sintano, the chance to actually compete, having been out to Tokyo um, with his horse and sacrificed uh, a bit of time and effort on that part. And uh, we were so close to beating the Germans, and uh, we, will, we are going to do that. And uh, fantastic results from, from all of them and a terrific team atmosphere. They really did us proud. So, and then... Uh, Running alongside the uh, senior Europeans in Hagen, we had the under-25s. Um, we had a full team there, uh, and that was great to see. And again, they got themselves in very close to a bronze medal position, but unfortunately, um, horses being horses, that didn't quite uh, materialise. But uh, they all had a, a, a lot of experience, learnt a lot, especially from running alongside the seniors and seeing the way the seniors manage their horses and they had, they learnt a lot. And Lewis Carrier was actually 12th in the freestyle, which is really creditable to him too. So that was, that was really good. And uh, really the next thing the seniors did was the Arkans Nations Cup. And again, we got Team Bronze. And that's the first time we've ever medalled. Well, not the first time we've ever medalled in Arkan, but the first time for a long time that we've medalled in Arkan. Uh, we had the World Breeding Championships as well. Um, this is always a difficult selection task because the uh, horses have to be uh, 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 British bred or uh, within the British selection to, to compete there. And um, I think we can claim a little bit of credit for Charlotte Fry and Kiento, although she was actually representing the Netherlands because the, um, the flag goes up, the podium flag goes up for the, for the, what, for the, for the horse and not for the rider. But she produced fantastic result to win the six-year-old title. And to Greg Sims with a homebred British horse, Waverley Fellini, um, managed to finish 16th, which was, again was a, a great credit to him. And Sarah Millis and Luke Barber Davis also took part and uh, will have gained a lot of experience with their horses for that. So the... Uh, Pressing the wrong buttons again. Juniors and Europeans, uh, again, they had very little chance to qualify and expose themselves to proper international competition, so they did really well. And uh, Annabelle, Annabella Pidgeley gaining uh, two silver medals, and uh, they all uh, performed very creditably. And although we didn't send a team to the Pony Europeans, we sent um, Ruby Hughes and Gracie Morgan, who learnt a lot about competing internationally and uh, delighted to see that Gracie Morgan capitalised on that experience and won just about everything at Kiso for the ponies. So that was uh, uh, a, a good job for her in her final year. So all in all, fantastic uh, uh, year, really, with a lot of lot condensed into it and a lot of hard work. But uh, now it's onwards to the World Championships in Herning in Denmark next year, where we have to start the whole thing again, the whole cycle again, and uh, get ourselves in the top six and qualify for the Olympic Games in Paris. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, and also thank you to uh, Jason and to Linda for the very kind words. I, I think in good old military terms, I'm D-Mob happy. I am no longer the para director. I'm very happily the retiring para di director. And welcome to Tracy. What a year it's been. Certainly when you look at what we've achieved in terms of the able body sport, um, our para riders did not disappoint. And I think it's very important that we keep this in huge perspective that whilst we have uh, the old guard of experienced competitors that flew out to Tokyo, they did so with rookie horses. To go into such a championship and to see the enjoyment on their faces as the, the work that they'd put in and the support team behind them to produce the exceptional results that we saw was not just inspiring to the sport, but I think certainly these three role models were inspiring to the nation too. Um, I'd like to also say that I think it touched a, a wonderful 
new sphere for para sport, but that we shall leave to the Channel 4 archives. Um, but nevertheless, I was still incredibly proud at that moment to be para director. But it's not just at the very top end of our sport that we've had success. I would not have thought, uh, standing in 2017 as the newly uh, appointed para director, with just 65 active athletes, about 100 registered, that we would be in a position of having broken not just our own British records in terms of participation and opportunity, but also in terms of having had our own records broken with championships. To go from four hours on a Sunday afternoon in Leicestershire uh, for a winter championship, where it was, don't get me wrong, the standard was high, to four-day extravaganzas of shows that our para-organisers have put on for us is something that I think, not just myself, but the whole of our committee are incredibly proud of. For us to be in a position where we have such a strong body of committed individuals, uh, there is much thanks to be had across the whole committee for making all of this possible. Uh, I, and I will single out a few people. I think without the support of Lou in the office and Tash and Felicity, we would have struggled. But the key members on our committee, and particularly the work that Sarah Leach has done and John Robinson, I will forever be in the debt for many of them that have stood by my shoulder when there has been a suggestion for a new initiative like the world first of the Intellectual Disability Championships, where they did, well, yeah, they didn't back down when it was simply a, well, let's just do it. And they've helped us make things happen. The future is extremely bright. We have a strong sport. It has been an absolute honour to terrify my fellow colleagues on the board which, with where we might take para next, but this is just one chapter. We are in an extremely strong position to be able to move forward and strengthen what we already have. Thank you. Hang on a moment, hang on a moment. I think we've both got to get in here together. Oh, Julie, we? it's my pleasure. Well, I shouldn't say it's my pleasure to give you a presentation because you're leaving. <laughs> it's my pleasure to, give you a pr to, to make a presentation yeah. to you. Um, Julie's been the marketing director since 2003 and then becoming para director after four years? Yes, 2017 took over as para director. And since then, she has really put her heart and soul into doing everything she can to further provision for the paras. Thank you. Um, so it's my pleasure to make this presentation to you, or rather Lou, who you've just mentioned, as making your life possible, has yeah. got the presentation. And maybe Lou, you'll tell us, can you come in here and tell us what you've got? Because it's, no, 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 I'm not going anywhere. I'm just no, don't down. go anywhere. I'm not allowed to go anywhere yet, yes. in a minute. So there's yeah. some flowers. Some flowers. Just let you struggle with them. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> there's some flowers. And there is a bottle of bubbly over there. No. The bottle of bubbly is um, for later. I wondered what she was doing in the curtains. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we know how precious your pony is, mm -hmm. um, so we had a oh. portrait done of him, um, with your help of George, by the way, I was scheming with him for a Keep while, so <laughs> just, I don't know whether they'll, so they'll see a, that. So a portrait of Julie's favourite horse, which has been organised by Lou here, to thank Julie for all she's done, and hope it reminds her of happy days with us. <laughs> I'll put this back on before everybody else. Um, it's, yes, I, at the risk of this turning into an Oscars speech, I, and, I, and I know where I stand if I overrun time, Linda, don't I? Yeah. Um, Certainly do. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's, only, it's only just the start of this new chapter for Para. It's truly been a, an honour to be part of the team that's seen us jettison British Para from where we were into the position that we're in. And, and it's going to be very nice to give our selectors a headache in the future as we see literally the tens and dozens of riders that are coming up through classification at the moment that are on exceptional horses. It, the future is extremely bright and you are in ex you're in very good hands with Tracy. Okay, thank you. Hi, good evening everybody. 
So, well, as, you, as we've heard, what a year it's been in, in many, many ways and many guises, but for, for ourselves, it's been about the evolution of our brand. Um, I'm going to put my glasses on. Um, so we had a purpose to build and build on the brand, to build a platform for the future, and that's uh, to connect with our existing members and obviously entice and, and engage new and potential, uh, new, new potential uh, members for us, telling the story of all of our members um, so they really understand what we do and how we do it. So our rebrand included uh, a new suite of marketing materials uh, for new members and for non-members, the rebrand of our online printed advertising campaigns and to create a new look um, for British dressage that fits with our new values, strategy and direction of the business. We have a new clothing range and if you haven't had a look, please do go online and have a look. It looks fantastic and this range will continue to be built on for next year. And BD at Home, a really exciting new approach for us to, to, to share information, particularly through lockdown, and keep engaged with everybody. Um, and that involved things such as uh, expert sessions, rider interviews, and health and wellness sessions that went down really well. And of course, on top of that, as already been mentioned uh, by Jason, is the, the new national championships. The new branding that we had there obviously reflected ourselves and Lemieux um, and to really create a fresh new look. Um, we obviously digitised how we connected with everybody and how you arrived, there were digital tickets um, and uh, with our online programme and spectator, spectator judging app and of course we'll continue to build on that. We got some great feedback and we'll continue to build on how we, how we really um, build that national um, showcase for us um, uh, for the future. But of course, we had the biggest platform of our sport, and boy, didn't they deliver. So our social media coverage up objectives were to provide up-to-the-minute news, updates and scores throughout the competition, ensuring all results were announced immediately, to maximise the exposure of dressage throughout the competition through engaging in relevant content, and to create content in keeping with the new brand. And the team in the office, uh, Becca, Millie, and obviously Winnie in comms, I think did the most incredible job of making us feel connected at all times with what was happening out there. And the, the images and the pictures that we had from behind the scenes were really fantastic. So the comms hub really formed a, an important part um, to keeping connected with that and all that relevant information. Um, and really, I think the stats speak for themselves. With over a million people reached on Facebook, absolutely incredible. 622,000 impressions on Twitter and the content and interactions on Instagram really growing. And of course, Charlotte becoming the most decorated uh, British female Olympia in all time uh, resulted in dressage trending on Twitter and a mention uh, on the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge's uh, official social media account and being mentioned by Royal McElroy in an interview as a fan of dressage. Hopefully we are reaching new audiences, royal ones at that. And of course the Paras, one incredible job that Lee, Sophie, Natasha and Georgia did. Um, and obviously we followed the same approach as the Olympics, uh, including combination of graphics and photo-led content to provide immediate scores and news stories and behind the scenes photos. Um, and Facebook reached again 337,000 people, 57,000 uh, engagements on the content that we published. So really appealing to a new market who maybe haven't understood what dressage is and particularly obviously understanding the incredible athletes that we have in our para community. And Lee Pearson on the, on the uh, uh, last leg, uh, well, incredible. And uh, we love the fact that it was Claire Balding's highlight. So certainly something to be proud of. So what's next? So we really want to build on this digital content. It's a really important part of how we live our lives today. And we want to engage with members uh, through sharing their stories. It's really important that we tell everybody's story so people can see what it's like to be part of our, our community uh, at all levels of the sport. Um, and we're going to build on the BD at Home content um, so we can provide men members with added value to their membership uh, by working with all groups of stakeholders, riders, judges, coaches, sponsors, partners on Ask the Esper, health and wellness and training content. 
We also want to enhance member benefits uh, with new and existing sponsors and partners, and that will be to explore how we can va add value to our membership categories, building on the increased interest and profile of dressage that we've managed to create and partner with new brands to provide additional benefits. And finally, we're going to build on the work that we carried out in 2021, such as the BD Fan Zone at the Nationals, live streaming and behind the scenes content to make our events even more reactive, interactive and engaging for everybody. It's been an absolutely incredible year. We've built a fantastic platform for the future. Now we just need to take it on from here. I'd like to hand over to not Paul, <laughs> but Charlotte. Good evening, and as Suzanne said, I'm not Paul Haler. Um, I am Charlotte Osborne, the Training Education Manager at BD, and I would first like to just start by saying a massive thank you to Paul Haler for all of his time and contribution during his eight years as Training Director. Um, I would also like to say that we're really looking forward to working with Harry in his new role. And we, over the last particularly 18 months with COVID, have massively appreciated all the contributions of the committee, and the coach education team who have helped us to keep the, the wheels on the bus, really. Um, so I'd just first like to start by doing a, an update on the coach development activity that we have <coughs> undertaken over the last 12 months. Um, we have level two and level three courses ongoing. Um, again, during COVID, this potentially could have been a massive issue if it wasn't for the work of Harry and the coach education team. We have shifted to a hybrid delivery model, which has been hugely successful and also made the courses far more accessible to more people. Um, in addition to this, really, the work that we have been doing in the background, while the qualifications are massively critical for what we do at BD, the ongoing development of the coaches is equally as important. So to support this work, BD has taken the lead on the National Development Programme for Coaching Excellence, previously delivered by British Show Jumping, which is a cross-federation initiative with coaches from all disciplines. So we will be taking that programme to deliver some of the coach education activity going forward. And in addition to that, we have also been, over the last 12 months, developing a coach accreditation um, CPD model. And what that's enabled us to do is to actually approve some really high quality training that's provided by third party um, deliverers. So some examples being um, uh, central biomechanics. And that's enabled us to offer a real diverse range of training activities to our coaches to encourage their further development. In addition to that, we have also put in place a standardised system to ensure that all of the regional training that is offered is consistent across the whole country. So meaning our coaches have access to really high quality CPD wherever they are in the country. In addition to this, we have also to date um, engaged 45 high profile trainers who have been um, invited to come onto a technical trainers list, which is a new initiative. And this is also to support the judge education system. So we recognise that it's not just about holistic coaching skills, but it is also about that continued development of the technical skills and knowledge. Looking forward, having recently done a consultation with our coaches on the accreditation list, we have identified some areas that the coaches feel that they would need further support and that they would like to see as part of a coach development and support package, which I think is particularly essential going forward um, to help our coaches get up to speed um, after COVID. Another initiative which uh, Paul Haley was very instrumental in, uh, in developing during his time is also the Young Horse Championships and Structure. So inclusive of young ponies, almost 600 combinations have competed through the 2021 series. 75 combinations have taken place in the seven-year-old qualifiers, which saw for the first time ever a championships taking place at the national championships, with Becky Moody and Jagerbom taking the, the first seven-year-old final. Um, the series continues to prove an excellent showcase for up-and-coming um, young horse talent, but also is a really great platform for British breeding. And we hope that um, next year we see further increases on that seven-year-old number. 
And looking forward to the remainder of the year, we have the National Convention, which is currently available online and also in person. So tickets are selling really well and it is a really exciting lineup with the theme being making medalists. So this is still accessible to everybody. There will be tips and takeaway hints for people to take home and implement into their own training. And we are joined by Katrina Verst, Philip and Christoph Hess, with also appearances from Ferdi Alberg and Tom Hunt will be doing um, some freestyle sections. And there is also some panel discussions from the world-class programme support staff who will provide some really interesting insights into the um, behind the scenes activity at Tokyo. So tickets are available online currently for you to purchase for in-person tickets and then the live stream will be launched very soon. Thank you and I'm going to hand it over to Peter Storr. Okay, thank you, Charlotte, and uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Charlotte, are you sure you wouldn't like to do this for me? This is not my forte, but anyway, I'm going to do my best, and uh, actually, Charlotte wrote these, so uh, <laughs> if I don't follow them, you'll know, <laughs> you'll know very well. So I'm going to start, I'm not very technical either, so we'll start off with the uh, Judges Education Project, um, uh, the previous old system, uh, sadly, due to COVID, uh, we couldn't do any testing in 2020 or 2021, which is a shame. Um, but we have been able to accommodate some of the FEI levels um, at high profile shows. So they have been able to take their exams at Berry Farm and Kiso. All these candidates were also provided an opportunity to refresh their training uh, before the assessment. Uh, the non-FEI levels, the lower listed judges, will be prov uh, provided with the opportunity to book an assessment before the end of 2021. Okay, the new system. Firstly, uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to the working party uh, that put this, helped put this system together. Special thanks must go to Jill Day, who um, really put together the non-technical uh, module and she's done a fantastic job. Linda Whetstone, thank you very much. She's put so much into into this as well. Not only uh, um, them, but also Charlotte Osborne, Jess LaRossa, and um, uh, the rest of the working party. So the new system, we've had a total of 588 uh, registrations so far. Um, the non-technical modules were rolled out in August 2021 and we had, uh, we've already had 478 candidates who have completed this since launch. The technical modules are now live. We've had 188 candidates complete to this date and the practical technical dates will be available from winter 21 to 22. Also, we've got a new exciting partnership with the Black Horse Online uh, One system um, with, with the uh, iPad system, and it's going to provide a clear system for evaluating and developing knowledge with our judges. Okay, so uh, moving on to 2022 initiatives. The launch of the online uh, Black Horse One seminars are going to replace our regional seminars um, providing valuable insight into performance and learning for our judges. Uh, the Principles of Judging Seminar, which has been highly popular uh, for the last few years, will move to a new spring slot um, to be arranged. We think it's going to be in March. The FEI seminar that was normally held at Olympia is now going to be at Hartbury CDI in July, and that will be for List 1, List 2A and 2s. And we're also going to continue the very successful online Zoom training sessions, which were developed in the lockdown of 2020. And they've been so popular, we're going to continue those. Um, there's also going to be a delivery of a standardized regional face-to-face -face training um, developed next year also. And finally, which I think is quite important, we're going to have uh, uh, more ongoing development for our tutor judges so we keep uh, all the training the same. Thank you very much. Perfect. 
Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm sorry if I sound a bit thick in the clear. I've got a stinking cold, which I do hope I haven't managed to spread amongst my colleagues. I won't be too popular if I have. But anyway, good evening, everybody. Um, as with everything else, our youth activities were affected by lockdowns. But I have to say a massive thank you to Hannah James, uh, our youth development officer, who managed to navigate the rules and regulations so successfully. Goodness knows how she managed it. She organised a hybrid model of the academies where riders could Zoom call their coaches prior to the academies and also undertake additional aspects virtually, meaning the practical sessions could be completed in single days with takeaway lunches and socially distant group activities. And the attitude, where there's a will, there's a way, was definitely to the fore. I also wish to thank Sarah Pidgley, who so generously let us use her family's home at Kilby's Farm. The experience of spending a weekend there with fantastic facilities, Michelin star food and great company is absolutely unique. That, together with all the expertise available to our academy riders, makes it an experience from which they learn a huge amount and have an unforgettable experience. In the summer, National Academy athletes take a trip to Talland, where the great schoolmaster horses educate them in flying changes, piaf, passage, counterparettes, or whatever they want to experience to give them a better grasp of how to train their own horses. Our grateful thanks to Pammy Hutton and also to Charlie Hutton. Hannah also laid on a really successful sports science day, which was very well received by everybody. As you can see, we have now selected 51 riders for our fourth year of Foundation Academies, and the first at Newbold Verdon was last weekend. Our horse care certificates have been rather delayed by COVID, but tiers one to three, that's the introductory, preliminary and novice of the online assessments are now complete, and we're planning to roll out the practical bits next year. Tiers four and five, the intermediate and advanced, which are much more detailed, should be ready by the end of 2022. And we will run these practical assessments nationally as there'll be more detailed demands, but fewer candidates. These levels have been carefully developed to ensure a meaningful series of certificates, which once achieved will prove their recipients have a pretty high level of competence in horse and pony management. We're currently conducting a complete review of the surprisingly large amount of educational programmes we currently offer to BD Youth. We aim to make this strand of BD Youth more streamlined, better publicised, more understandable and easily accessible. Every cloud has a silver lining and we found that there were some youth activities which we could do just as well on Zoom. One of these was our formal squad assessments. We will continue to offer this option in future as it helps people who live in remote areas. Although we could not run our youth into regionals this year and Sheepgate ran without team competitions, the Home International did run at Mount Ballon in Wales, thanks in no small part to the ingenuity and tremendously hard work of our fantastic development officers. 140 riders took part and it was good to see some, perhaps not so socially distant, get togethers. All had fun and the weather played ball too. Thank you Wales for hosting this competition. Finally, a huge thank you to everybody who makes BD Youth function. Charlotte Osborne and Hannah James in the office, our development officers, youth reps, coaches, judges, parents, riders and their horses and ponies. And last but not least, to my really hard working committee. They provide a wealth of experience and knowledge to back me up and keep BD Youth on such a positive track for the future. Fingers crossed for a less socially distanced, team orientated 2022, where BD Youth will continue to bring people and horses of all ages together. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all of our directors for their presentations. Uh, hopefully that gave you a flavour of all the things that we've been working on um, throughout this year in British dressage, um, despite all of the ongoing challenges of COVID, as well as give you a flavour of what we're looking at for 2022 and beyond as part of the rollout and implementation of our strategic plan. So we now move on to the final uh, part of today's meeting, which is uh, the opportunity to answer member questions. And obviously, because we are here in the Windmill Hotel in Meriden, we gave you the opportunity uh, to submit your questions in advance. So thank you very much for those of you who sent those in. And I will endeavour to answer now 
as many as I can. So we'll start off with um, three governance questions that were sent in. Um, first of all, Joanna Fielder asked, with over 17,000 BD members, of which only around 230 are registered para riders, do you think it's fair that all members are allowed to vote on para-related matters when the outcome is of little or no consequence to the majority of the membership? Would it not be fairer to let the voices of the para community carry a greater weighting, voting for matters that directly concern them, rather than potentially being drowned out and effectively silenced by the able-bodied majority? So, I think it's important that we stress here that it's vital for us that all members have a say in who represents their interests at board level. Board directors are responsible for the strategic oversight and good governance for the whole of British dressage, not just their technical area of expertise. While we do need to ensure that directors have the technical knowledge, the skills and the capability for their specific role, as trustees for the charity, all board directors have a much broader set of responsibilities that extend across the whole sport. So it's the function of the nominations committee that we put in place to scrutinise all of the applications and ensure that only suitable candidates are put forward for election by the membership. However, it would be no more appropriate for para riders only to vote for the para director than it would be for only judges to vote for the judges director or for only coaches to vote for the training director. It is vitally important, as I say, that the board is able to represent the interests of all of our riders at all levels. For our next question, Derek Pullum asked, COVID-19 has made it difficult to hold in-person AGMs for all companies, but can the CEO confirm the approximate number of votes received in person and by proxy today? Given that the membership of BD is around 17,000, what efforts are being made to expand attendance at next year's AGM? My Voice, who provide a board election process, also provide in-person and virtual AGM, AGM platforms. Will BD consider this for 2022? Well, the uncertainty related to COVID was certainly the major influencing factor in determining the date and location of this AGM. We totally agree that it has been far from ideal that we've had to host, host this in a hotel for the last two years. And prior to the pandemic, the intention was actually to hold our AGM at Arena UK to coincide with the Summer Area Festival Championships. We did in fact have a members meeting there last week where we had 25 in attendance to meet with a senior management team face to face, which made a really nice change. But of course, we would ideally like to have greater levels of engagement as we return to some semblance of normality next year. It's important to note though, that at Stoneley where we held the AGM on the first day of our national championships, there would typically be only around 80 to 90 people in attendance. Even last year when the AGM was held online for the first time, we had a peak viewing audience of around 120 people. So while we're definitely open to exploring ways in which we can get more members involved, it's important that members recognise that the AGM is their opportunity to provide their feedback and ensure that their views are adequately represented. So we would encourage as many of you to get involved as possible. Now, due to the lead-in times and question marks over what restrictions might be in place uh, in October this year, we felt it was prudent to plan for a hybrid AGM so that we could allow people to attend in person, which they have done, as well as offering the live streaming option, and hopefully many of you are following this online. We had to make a decision on this back in mid-June when there was still a great deal of uncertainty around running public events, especially indoors. However, hopefully we can return to a more normal operation for our AGM next year, and Arena UK would probably be our first preference rather than the Nationals at Summerford, as we have suit suitable facilities available there, and it's right bang in the middle of the country. Today we have 24 people in attendance here in Meriden, for the AGM, so thank you very much for attending. Plus we had 29 proxy votes submitted in advance. But obviously we do recognize this is a, a, a relatively small number, and so we'll be certainly looking at ways in which we can make the AGM more interactive online, whether that's using my voice or another technology platform. Derek Pullum also asked, the Finance Committee minutes of the 3rd of August noted that there would be a subcommittee review of the charity's reserve policies. Who was on that committee? What were its terms of reference? And has any decision been reached from their meeting in September? 
Well, it's correct that a, a working group was formed to consider and formulate a reserves policy in August. This included the finance director as chair, as well as the chief executive and three other members of the finance and business development committee. A draft reserves policy was produced and presented to the finance and business development committee at the end of last month. And then the final version was discussed and ratified as at today's board meeting, as you heard earlier from Caroline. So that will be published on the BD website in due course. And it's important that that reserves policy reflects our strategic planning, our budgeting, and our risk management processes. Now, we have to have sufficient resources in place to protect the organization and sport in the event of a force majeure situation, as we've experienced in the last 18 months. It's absolutely crucial if we're going to continue the operation of British dressage against the backdrop of a pandemic like we've experienced with COVID or indeed with the equine influenza outbreak, which could have caused a full suspension for our sport. We also need to have money available for specific projects, such as our judge education system or our youth professional development strategy, where it might require some additional funding up front. So BD needs to have sufficient resources to respond to these investment and growth opportunities as we set out in the strategic plan. Although, as Caroline noted, the reserves will also be invested to ensure that any funds maintain their value insofar as is possible. Moving on to some questions around our rules. Julie Smith asked, given that outbreaks of equine influenza returned to normal levels in August 2019 and have remained very low ever since, will BD be returning to an annual vaccination policy? If not, please provide the scientific evidence and justification for not doing so. The vast majority of members are unlikely to ever compete at an international event or need to comply with FEI rules, and other organisations such as the British Riding Clubs have already reverted back to the annual programme. Well, this issue was a topic for discussion at a recent British Equestrian Federation Council meeting where there was a presentation on behalf of the Equine Infectious Diseases Advisory Group. It was also the, on the agenda today and discussed at length at the board meeting we held earlier. Now, while we're aware that the BRC have reverted back to an annual program for EI vaccinations, subsequent to that, the British Horse Racing Authority have moved to a six-month monthly booster requirement from their previous nine-month regime. Um, the EIDAG continues to strongly endorse and recommend a six-monthly booster protocol and encourage the Olympic disciplines to ma maintain a gold standard wherever possible, in line with FEI regulations. The scientific evidence supports maintaining the current rules. EI vaccines include measurable antibodies that produce uh, protection against infection and disease. These decline with time after vaccination, and some horses are proven to be less well protected at 12 months versus six months after their booster. Studies by the Animal Health Trust indicate that the vaccine strains become outdated over time, and based on their mathematical models, as well as field data gained in the last few years, there are smaller outbreaks with horses that have received these six monthly boosters. While the reduction in the movement of horses over the last 18 months due to COVID has resulted in a lower prevalence of equine influenza in the community, there is no room for complacency. And the best, route, best protection that we can give to our horses is to maintain the current minimum requirement of mandatory annual vaccinations with a booster within six months plus 21 days prior to the horse competing. This remains in line with the FEI, British eventing and higher level pony club competition. We also had a couple of organiser questions submitted from Duncan Whitney Groom, who asked, can you advise why we have to set competition dates and levels so many months in advance? If we only had to set classes six weeks prior to the competition, there would be a better opportunity to secure judges in that timescale, as understandably, many don't want to commit so far in advance. It would help us to avoid clashes and issues in gaining judges, stewards and competitors if we did not have to set schedules so far in advance, especially as, the, especially as they do not currently appear in the magazine. The current opening date is six weeks prior to competition, so riders cannot enter prior to that date in any case. Now, the competition schedules were initially removed from the BD magazine as a short-term measure during COVID, as we were not in a position to plan ahead with any certainty. Uh, with fixtures and competition dates likely to change and require further updates or amends. 
Now, one of the drawbacks of having the competition schedules in the magazine rather than online is that they're out of date from the moment that they're published. From an operational perspective, therefore, it would be our preference to maintain these in electronic form on the BDE website so that we can ensure that the information provided to our members is current and correct. However, many members have requested that the competition schedules are restored in the magazine from 2022 onwards. There are some who have professed expressed a strong preference for having these in printed form well in advance in order to aid with their competition planning. Now the discussions on this remain ongoing as there, uh, as there may well be a compromise solution that allows an abridged version for competition listings to be included in a magazine with the full schedule including details on specific classes and levels available online only. So that's what we'll be exploring over coming weeks. Now once a normal calendars restored from the 1st of January onwards. Our intention is to return to publishing all major dates in advance of fixture meetings as we did prior to the pandemic. So all our organisers will be informed of these when planning the allocation of their competition dates and we can avoid clashes wherever possible. But may I take this opportunity to thank you for all of your understanding um, during the uh, COVID crisis and your flexibility that you've shown in helping us uh, get the show back on the road. It is very much appreciated. And we do understand it has been a difficult and challenging time for all of our stakeholders, but particularly organisers and venues. And we thank you for your support. Duncan Whitney Groom also asked, why do BT continue to charge venues fixed starter levies for novice and elementary qualifiers, regardless of the numbers entered in those classes? So I think it's important to look back and recognize that these were originally introduced to discourage venues from running unaffiliated competition at those levels on the same day as qualifiers for affiliated dressage, which resulted in dilution and smaller class sizes. Now that's obviously not desirable for anyone, but particularly our competitors and officials. There are some exemptions in place for those venues in remote areas that do not have sufficient numbers of competitors to meet these minimum starter number requirements. And we did waive these fees post COVID to help assist venues during the recovery period. It is as all these things are a balance that needs to be achieved because obviously we want to make sure that we have competitive class sizes and the balance between um, member demand and the number of competitions that are available for them to compete in. So it is something that we will carry on and continue to review. More sport operations questions. Uh, we had another one submitted from Derek Pullum. Um, the sport operations committee minutes of the 5th of May stated that a working group had been established to review the silver structure and pathways for our regionals and area festivals. Who is on that working group? What are the terms of reference? And when are they expected to report? Well, unfortunately, due to COVID, we have been unable to start work on this review just as yet, although it remains a priority for the Sports Operations Committee over coming months. Due to the running of the rescheduled winter fixtures and summer season qualification in parallel, all of our championships have been condensed this year into a six-month time frame. With a qualification carryover and reduced points requirement, it would have been quite difficult to conduct any meaningful review this year due to these exceptional circumstances. However, now that we have got the first year of our summer area festivals under our belt, we'll have more data to work with. So this is on the agenda for further discussion at the next Sport Operations Committee meeting in November, when we aim to set out the terms of reference for this review and formally constitute the working group. And the intention would be for this group to produce their report by the spring of next year. Now, I'm conscious that I've talked for an awful lot and my mouth is getting dry, but I've got probably a dozen more questions that were submitted all around our national championships. So I thought rather than go into all of those in detail, it was better to um, take all of that uh, on board in terms of your questions, your comments, your feedback about the nationals at Summerford, um, including those raised at our members meeting at Arena UK last week, and rather address, address them individually, I'm going to give you a full overview and background to this year's championships. So we only had the green light to run the national championships as a full-blown spectator show in mid-June. So we had just weeks rather than the usual 12 months to pull together such a large scale event. And this was all on a new site with significant changes to the format, the timetable and the showground layout. The move to a new location gave us a third arena, which meant that we could open up additional competition opportunities. 
New silver classes for the Prix St. George and Inter One were joined by PSG Gold Freestyle and Prelim Gold, as well as an inaugural under-21 championships and the seven-year-old championship. A further eight classes had their numbers increased by 112 places in total, providing an extra 250 competition spots over the four days. So from a competitor's perspective, I think the event worked really well, particularly in terms of the flow on the site, from the new barn staff stables to the individual warm-up areas for each arena. The main show arena had a real championship atmosphere surrounded by spectators on all sides, with free seating offering space for up to 1,500 spectators, and the Nationals Pavilion providing a fantastic view over two arenas. Many said that it provided much more of a continental feel to the showground, much like an international CDI, which was great to hear. And actually, the feedback that we've received from members has been overwhelmingly positive overall. So really, thank you again for coming along and supporting us. But it was particularly challenging running the national championships this year at a brand new venue against the dual backdrop of both COVID and Brexit, which provided us with a number of obstacles that we had to overcome. Whereas we had access to permanent facilities and resources at Stoneleigh, including toilets, Wi-Fi, electricity and water, at Summerford, most of the infrastructure was temporary. The compacted season for outdoor events made that, meant that the contractors and suppliers were in high demand and very difficult to source this year. Retailers were also reluctant to commit to trade stands. Some have gone out of business during COVID. Others have changed their commercial model to selling online only. This was all compounded then by supply chain issues and staff shortages, resulted in changes to, to, resulting in changes to suppliers at the 11th hour, and a number of food concessions dropping out even in the last 10 days building up to the show. So under those circumstances, I was very proud that BD, Show Direct, and the Summerford teams managed to, to pull the championships off at all. While of course there's room for improvement, and we do share members' desire to have a better range of healthy food options, for example, as well as a greater variety in the number of trade stands, it must all be understood in the context of this year's championships, which were very unique. Now, the escalating costs in running event of this nature also needs to be recognised. Since our last nationals at Stoneley in 2019, the cost of seating alone rocketed from £9.50 per seat to £23 per seat for the covered grandstand and £18, for the uncovered, £18 for the uncovered seating. So that's heavily subsidised by BD. This requires a significant investment in order for us to put on a show of this magnitude. Therefore, while we understand that there is a strong desire from our members to have the national championships available via live streaming, this has to be balanced against the commercial viability of the show. Uh, it is simply not true to assert that this would not have an impact on footfall. Other sports have exactly the same problem and exactly the same commercial pre pressures on attendance at live events. It inevitably does cannibalise income. Now we will continue to look at this uh, and, and examine potential ways in which we could make it work in future years. But it will need to stack up for us financially, including the additional investments required in production costs. While members have indicated that they would be happy to pay for to access live streaming, it is unlikely that this price point would be equivalent to the face value of tickets. And we do rely on spectators to make the show pay, as well as generate footfall for trade stands and create the atmosphere that you'd all expect at a championship event. So we have agreed today at today's board meeting that we will formulate a working group to take a closer look at this and see if we can come up with uh, a commercial model that works but do bear in mind the context for those discussions and appreciate that it is not an easy nut to crack. Another point raised by a number of members related to the programme not being avail available in printed form this year due to COVID, as well as our ongoing attempts to make uh, the event as environmentally friendly as possible, it was a conscious decision to make the Nationals paperless this year. Therefore, there were no physical tickets or programmes at all, and these were instead produced in digital form. Programme sales have been in decline for a number of years now, from a peak of around 12 to 1,500, down to just 400 to 500 copies. So again, this became a loss-making enterprise for BD. Nevertheless, we are aware that mem members have expressed a strong preference for printed starter sheets, so this is something we will look to address next year so we can hopefully have the best of both worlds. We'll also make sure to make the information easier to access via the live scoring app, 
as well as provide charger stations so your mobile phones don't run out of juice. But again, we thank you for all your feedback on all of these points, and we will take that on board as part of our wash-up uh, when we look at reviewing this year's national championships at our meeting next month. The BD Fan Zone was a popular edition with up to 1,700 of you viewing the sessions online, broadcast on Facebook Live, and we learned an awful lot from the other digital initiatives that we introduced this year, from the e-ticketing to the live scoring. But this was just the start. It provides us with a good foundation on which to build and continue to evolve the show. As, as Suzanne said earlier, we want to make it as interactive, accessible, and enjoyable as possible for spectators. We'll be sending out a feedback questionnaire to competitors and those who bought tickets very soon. So please do take time to complete it if you came uh, to complete it if you came to Summerford. We want to work with all of you and our other stakeholders to make the Nationals our flagship show. So your input is absolutely vital. Now we did have a couple more sport-specific questions, but these relate to particular individual areas. So we will provide the answers to those online, if that's okay. Um, all of the answers to all of these questions will be available as part of our minutes for today's AGM. Um, before I close and lose my voice completely, I would just like to hand over to the audience if anyone else um, who is in attendance today, if you have any questions to ask either myself or any of the board of directors, please do let us know. We have a microphone on hand if you want, don't be shy. <laughs> Just raise your hand and we will bring the microphone over to you. But otherwise, if you've heard enough from me, I will say thank you once again for all of your um, outstanding support and your loyalty and your contribution to British Dressage in making it what it is. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed competing this year and we're looking ahead to a very bright future in 2022 and beyond with your support. Thank you and I'll hand you back to our chairman, Linda Whetstone, for closing remarks. Thank you very much, Jason. Um, and um, I think Jason's really given my closing remarks. Um, I, what I wanted to do is to reiterate our huge thanks to everyone involved with BD for the support we've received over the last 18 months. We couldn't have weathered the storm of this COVID crisis without the loyalty and commitment you have all shown us. As I hope has been evident this evening, the BD board, our technical and regional committees, team of dedicated staff have been working 24 seven behind the scenes on behalf of our members throughout. So your continued contribution is, all, is, is much appreciated by all of us. To all BD members, whatever your role, thank you all very much for your part in helping us get back onto the road of recovery. After the successful final six months, uh, there's plenty of hope for the future, and we're especially hopeful that we can return to a normal calendar events in 2022. Thank you for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you again at BD competition, training event, or championship very soon. Good night.